Thank you so much for joining us here today, Petter. Um, just to let everyone know, we'll start off with some questions from me, uh, but most of the questions today will come from all of you, so please um, keep them prepared. Um, I'd like to start off by asking you a bit about your journey um, to where you are today. You started off playing football at the age of 17, professionally, um, when you made your debut in the Fortuna Liga, which is the Czech First League. Um, what was it like being thrown into the spotlight at such a young age, and how has it kind of shaped the rest of your career? Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you know, I, when I was 17, I, I signed my first professional contract with uh, Hmel Blasani, which, is, uh, which was the small team in the, in the top uh, Czech division. And, um, you know, when I joined there, obviously I was 17. I was a part of the first team, but uh, you know, when you, when you join at this age, you don't, you're not guaranteed to start as a, as a main goalkeeper. So I had to work my way uh, to the, you know, to that starting uh, lineup. And I came to the team which had no reserve team. So obviously you train every day, but then you're missing, then you're missing the opportunity to play games every, every weekend, which is very important to play games, get the match day experience. And the only team I could play was the under-18 team, which played the youth league, but not even the top division. So I asked the manager that I said, listen, I need to have a much kind of much day uh, experience, no, no matter in what level uh, I wanted to play. So before I made my debut, actually, uh, which was moved thanks to the TV on Monday, uh, I actually played the game for, the, for that youth team on Sunday and uh, halfway through the game the manager ran, in, ran on the, on the touchline and actually made me substitute. So he just pulled me out of the game uh, and I played so well, I made so many saves and I was completely gutted that he took me out and I didn't understand it. But then he explained to me that I would start my, uh, my, my, my top league uh, debut the next day. We played away at Sparta Prague, which was the, by far the best team and historically the best team in the country. They had 11 internationals starting in the, uh, literally whole national team will start, was starting the game. And uh, you know, I knew that I was gonna, I was gonna play the game. So obviously it was live on TV, best team. And it, it, you know, it was, a, it was a big challenge, but in a way, I was so happy that, that it's, it's that way because sometimes you, you think you start with a small team and then you have a bigger chance to win. But, but when, you, when you challenge yourself with the best, then you know where you stand. And I was 17 and played the game, although we lost 3-1 uh, uh, and the first goal I conceded was the first shot and it was from penalty actually. Um, I knew during the game, I actually knew that I have enough quality and enough in me to, to play at this level and, and it actually showed me that I can and, and give me a lot of motivation to, to carry on working. So, you know, when you're in the spotlight is one thing, but, um, but you know, when, when you, while you're on the pitch, you cannot think of somebody's watching, you know, you cannot think of that there is a lot of people watching, you are live on TV because it's a distraction. All you have to care about is to execute your game. So to be successful, you have to play your game. And to be, you know, to play your game, you have to concentrate on what you do, not how many people see it. So, you know, I, I've all, I, had the, I always had that in, you know, my, my, uh, my way of playing the game. I'm kind of like a computer's processor. I go step by step in a clear process of thinking and executing what I need to do without jumping those little steps in, in which you reach the target. And I'm not, I'm not worrying about the score, I'm not worrying about the time. Uh, although you, co you consider the time because obviously if you are a few minutes left in a game, you are winning, then you, you know, you tactically you play, you slow the game. But apart of that, you know, I play the same game, I always play the same game for entire game, no matter if it was a Champions League friendly game or if there were people, there were not people. Um, if we were winning 5-0, losing 3-0, for me it never, it never changes. So in my head my score is always 0-0 nil -nil, 
and I, and I go with the process. And, and actually, this is, takes you out of the spotlight, because if you start thinking about that, then you know, it might be too much to, to handle, and, and this is probably where you don't do what you need to do. So speaking of these high-pressure situations, um, I'd like to take you back to the 2012 Champions League final. Um, so it was your performance in that final um, that earned you the title of the fans' man of the match, and you saved three penalties over the course of the game. Um, how, did it play to feel, how did it feel to play such a huge role in the final and essentially go down in history through this one moment? Well, we go back to what I just said, you know, if you, if you go to the game uh, knowing that there is millions of people watching live on TV, uh, that winning the Champions League is probably the ultimate goal of, for any football player. Um, I, had, I had lost one Champions League final, it was the worst feeling ever. Um, and you don't want to, uh, you know, you don't want to experience that disappointment again, and at the same time, you know that um, it's so hard to get in the Champions League final that it might be your last chance. So imagine you go to the game with all this pressure and then you go like, okay, if we don't win it now, we might never win it because it takes time and your career is never you know, endless. So uh, you know, the pressure was huge and you know, that's why the, you know, concentrating only on the game and preparation was the key. And, you know, people always say that, you know, you have to be confident. You know, it's easy to say, I'm going to be confident, I'm going to do this. When you are not backed by preparation. So for me, the confidence is something which comes through preparation. If you are prepared, you are confident because you know you're prepared and then actually gives you the edge of, you know, I'm prepared, I've done everything in my preparation. There is no reason not to, you know, to be worried. You go in the game and you just play. So the preparation for the game was actually the key and it was hours and hours spent watching the, the videos of Bayern and their penalties and the, star, you know, the strikers, how they finish the actions, what they like to, where they like to shoot and then obviously then you do the work on the pitch as well. So when it came, when it came to the game, it, you know, I, I knew I was prepared. We, as a whole team, we knew we were prepared. And I think that's why you know, we were ready to, uh, to play the game. And although we had a lot of difficulties during the game, you know, the, the togetherness, the spirit, the preparation, everything together actually uh, got us through the game. But uh, I have to say that um, you know, sometimes it's easier said than done. And you know, usually you have the ritual before, before the game of preparing, so some people sleep, have a nap, some people sleep longer, some people just watch some series or just uh, relax and, and uh, because you spend the whole day in the hotel prior to the game. The kickoff was uh, 8.45 local time, p.m. So you have literally, you wake up, we arrived the day before, you have the official training session, then you spend you know, the night in the hotel, then you have a whole entire day to, before the, the kickoff starts. And this is where your you know, brain starts going. This is where you, know, you go over all these things and then pressure and what if we lose and you want to win and all these things come in a, in a circle. And um, I usually had in the afternoon um, like 20 minutes nap. I wouldn't even call it a nap. It was kind of like a power nap because if I slept a bit longer, I, I, I would have a, I would got a headache. And especially after the head injury, you know, it would completely, you know, put me off. So, so I knew that I had probably 15, 20 minutes for some kind of a power nap, which I literally sit and just relax and concentrate on my breathing and sort of recharge. Um, I couldn't do that because, you know, the, with all these informations and with everything, you know, with the pressure, I just couldn't do it. So what happened was that, you know, some, some people might know I'm, I'm a drummer as well. So I'm drumming, so I always have, anywhere I go, I always have a practice pad and sticks in my back. And obviously going to Munich, I had the same thing because, you know, when you sit in the hotel, you have nothing to do. I like to do things. I don't like wasting time. I don't watch series. I, I, I prefer to do different things. I learn a few languages like that. I, learned, I know I was practicing my drumming like that. And I probably drum for three hours on the afternoon of the Champions League final because... <laughs> 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 so 
so I had my part and I was playing and playing and playing and put some music and you know and, 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 and it sort of kind of calmed me down and and then then you know I sort of relaxed a little bit and and you know it helped me actually to prepare. So you know if you yeah. ever play Champions League final, make sure you have your practice button <laughs> sticks. Do you have any favorite things to play at all? No, when you have the practice part, you just go through kind of like a little technical, you know, drills and rudiments and, and you know, this is what I was doing, you know. Some, and then in the end, actually, I have to say, I, I kind of built like a little drum kit from the sofa and, uh, <laughs> and I sort of played around with, uh, with some song. But uh, I have to say, you know, there are many ways how to, how to, how to do things. This was not planned, but in the end it worked. So you mentioned just now that one of the things you do besides football is speaking several languages and you like learning new languages. Um, could you talk a bit about the languages you speak and how that's helped you in your profession over the past several years? Well, I think the, f the first one which forced me to, to, to learn, obviously, was when I was at school I had to pick. Uh, I'm originally from Czech Republic and, um, and obviously 60% of our borders is Germany. Uh, then you have a bit of Austria, so obviously, you know, the German language comes like a first sort of natural option. So when I, when I, when I, had, when I had to choose the, the language at school, I started with German. Um, then as you go and get older, you need to pick a second language, then I, then I, uh, then I chose English. And um, so obviously when I reach the, the professional level, and I started playing well for the under-21 national teams or the youth national teams. And there were some possibilities to, to go abroad, to, to go a better club, bigger club, um, better league. Obviously, I wish that it was Germany or it was a, a, a country where I could use the language because it would be much easier to adapt and go. So first thing was don't go to France. Everybody says French is too... Uh, complicated, so as, as, as you know, I ended up in France. <laughs> so I went to France and I couldn't say a word, uh, French, which at the start obviously it's a problem because you don't understand anybody. There was not many English-speaking um, players or even people in the club at the time. It was in 2002 when I arrived there, so, you know, it, it creates kind of a, a problem for normal life, which, you know, sometimes you can do without talking to people and hoping everything is fine and that you find a way if something happens. But, you know, being a goalkeeper, the, the biggest part of, the, of my game is communication with people on the pitch, that I give them right advice, right instruction, what I need them to do, that it helps everybody to sort of defend well and then I'm protected. So, and I learned that actually when I signed the first professional contract, my goalkeeper coach was a uh, was, was, um, ex-goalkeeper. He was in the mid-50s already by then and he was constantly talking as a with everybody, I think some players didn't really like him because you could hear him all day, you know, as, you, as soon as you came to the training ground, it was just him talking, talking, talking and talking. But one day he came to me and he said, remember one thing, if people do their jobs, you have nothing to do and it's actually much better. So I understood the, the message. So when you, when you give right um, instructions to players, give them right advice, right information in the right time, it helped them to make a clearer um, decisions and they have split seconds so sometimes the right actually advice or instruction help them to make the right decision so everything's happening so fast so when I came to France obviously the biggest issue I have uh, was that people would you know I, I couldn't tell them what I really want so I put in my contract that I want to have the, the teacher for every day at least two hours. So obviously the club provided me with that. So after every training session, I went two, uh, two hours to the classroom and tried to learn the, the basic uh, language and, and obviously the all day communication, which is usually happening on the pitch. And then, you know, with this, I've done that for about a month and then I could do I actually learned enough that I could live outside of the training ground using the language 
with the basic form, but I could with no with the confidence and no problem. And actually, I could tell everybody on the pitch what I needed. So, so obviously that again the preparation for it and giving the time and effort to learn the language helped me to settle quicker. You know, understand the the, the situation and and um, I have to say the this was kind of the lesson to, to know that you know when when you can communicate life becomes much uh, much easier so then later when i when i signed for chelsea we had some players who came in the last minute uh, we had asia del horno who came from uh, from spain he couldn't say a word english so talking to him in english you know he Sometimes you tell him something and he would do something completely else uh, because we knew that you know he only started learning the language and actually it was faster for me to learn Spanish than for him to learn English. <laughs> so, so, so then in the end I, I started learning Spanish, the words I needed to tell him. So, and as I used the French talking to French speaking and then English to, you know, the English speaking, um, then I realized that you know if I can speak Spanish, then then obviously I can you know use that the same way because you know when you hear the play, hears it in the in the native language, actually reacts to this the fastest. So it was probably the easiest way to do. Then if you speak to group of players, obviously you, the, everything is in English. So I used that to my to my advantage. You know you know and uh, and then I started learning Spanish on the hotels where you know when we spent sometimes a lot of time traveling and planes and this, so I, I, took, a, I, I took the time to, to buy some Spanish grammar and, and I learned myself when I, when I could. And obviously when you have people around and you speak every day with, uh, with people you practice and then in the end I, uh, you know, this is how I learned a few other languages. So I have to say this is something which is very important. So beyond these language barriers, did you have any kind of other difficulties communicating with your teammates? And are, are there any skills you've picked up to lead a team or communicate with your fellow team members? I, I think you, you, you have to know who is who. In a way, you find out how the player behave, how they play, and how they respond to the communication. So with some people, you had to be really, like, really shouting at them. There was no choice because otherwise they wouldn't really, you know, do it. With some people, you kind of had to be more sort of like a friend and go and just you know slip few things and and that they don't they didn't feel too offended about something. So I think that this the communication skill actually helps you to understand how people are. And with with some people was uh, was um, uh, was tricky, you know. Some when when we, we I met a few of your members before. And they asked me about who was the player who gave me the most problems, and I said that it was Branislav Ivanovic because <laughs> because when he got into his zone on the match day, you know, he was in his zone, and it was hard to take him out of his zone to to do actually what we needed him to do. But he, the, the great thing about him was that he was aware of that. He was aware that sometimes he would forget, uh, you know, to to go back, and he would be while watching. So. So in a way, he always, before the game, he came to me and he said, you have to speak to me, don't forget to speak to me, call me, shout, do whatever, but you know, bring me, you know, that, I can, that, that I can be on time and where I need to be. So he was literally the one who even demanded it more. With some people, you don't really have to do it because they play the way that they take care of, the, of themselves and you don't have to speak too much to them. And uh, some, some people actually, you know, prefers to have a, like a short, uh, rather than, than talking too much. So, so it, all, it all depends, and I think you learn that through the, you know, the, the, the games, from, through the time you train and play with people, if you pay attention, if you don't, obviously you don't. Um, going back a bit now, I'd like to talk about your head injury. So in 2006, you were playing a game against Reading and you um, fractured your skull. But just a few months down the line, you were back playing football again. Um, so what were the months following this injury like for you and how did you build your career back up after that? Well, ironically, it was 14 of October. So today we are 14 of October. So it's actually 13 <laughs> years to date. So I hope I will have a better experience of Oxford to, to, to the night. I hope, so. I, I hope nobody is ready to throw something at me. <laughs> um, 
So I, I have to say, you know, when um, the, the first few days after the surgery, I was in induced coma, so obviously I don't remember anything. I didn't have, uh, I didn't have, I couldn't retain any information for a few days. So basically, the people who were looking after me and and um, uh, and and took care of me, obviously, they they had to see how I progress, how my brain uh, progresses after the after when they when they woke me up after a few days, and uh, I I remember that they they were they were asking me questions, so that. You know, for you, if I ask you what's the day today, where you are, I think all of you will just say, why is he asking that? You know, we are in England, we are in Oxford, it's the 2019 and we are at 14th of October, everybody knows it's Monday. So the doctor kept asking me this question and I had no clue. I just couldn't tell him anything. And, uh, you know, it was one of the you know, worst feelings I had because these were the questions I knew that, you know, it's easy to answer. And suddenly, I, I didn't know. So after a few days of, you know, suffering a little bit from that, I, I suddenly my my teammates came to visit, and all my, all the memories suddenly kind of came back. Seeing the familiar faces and people talking to me, I, uh, you know, I actually realized that oh, you know, it's me. Uh, I realized my name. I knew who is who and and then suddenly my memory came back. So I started from there. But the issue, I had plenty of different issues, which was the, the speech. I was uh, mixing words the way that, no, that, you know, if you have a phonetically same words, I was mixing them up. So, you know, if you wanted to say the phone is on the table, I could, I could come and say the cone is on the cable. And obviously, the. In my head, I said phone is on the table. You would hear the cone is on the cable, which was completely confusing for everybody. And I got frustrated because, you know, suddenly you speak to people, they can't understand you. So there were all these little challenges on the way where you realize, okay, it's not going to be as easy as it looks. And, and obviously, I was advised to forget about the whole season. So we were in October and, and obviously, you know, until the end of the season was uh, the end of... Uh, uh, May, so I was advised not to do anything, take, to, to take my time to, uh, to see how everything would go and then probably start the preseason and prepare for the next season, which in my head was like, why should I wait if I can start doing everything step by step, day by day, uh, and to see how I go. So I actually didn't put any timeline. I just, I just work every day. I woke up and I said, okay, I will do the best I can to you know, to go as, as, as best as I can to back to, the, to playing, which there was never guaranteed that I would. But, you know, in a way, if you never try, you never know. So I was saying, OK, I do my best and I will see where it takes me. So every day, the best look different way. So sometimes I would do five minutes of activity and then I, I would sleep all day because, you know, I just couldn't do anything. Sometimes I, I realized that I had the probably um, you know, I got signed from my buddies when, when things were go going wrong. So basically, I kind of like switched off as a, like, you know, when you press the switch off button, you know, that could happen to me at any time the first few weeks. So basically, I learned how to listen to my body. I had that, I, I, then I figured once, once I got on the wrong side where I passed out in the wood walking my dog and and obviously then I learned what was the signal. I sort of ignored it because I thought it's not, it's not it. And then I realized it was it. So then since then, I listened to my body properly. And then every time the signal came, which my eyes started doing a little bit like that, I knew that I had a few minutes to sit down and relax. So I was, I was doing by this. But some days I could work three hours, four hours, eight hours. Some days I couldn't do anything. So basically when we pre pre prepared the program with the doctors and physios and everybody, I was, I was in charge because they could, they could never know if I can or if I can't. So we, we sort of prepared it and I was telling him, okay, we carry on. So sometimes we would do the program for three days in one day and then for two days we would sort of do like a little bit. It depended on days and, and it was getting better and better and better. So obviously I knew that I'm on the, on the right track, but still the question mark was whether I can, you know, go fast enough to go back on the, on the pitch. 
and you need 12 weeks for the skull fracture to consolidate. So basically 12 weeks was the first clear target that I couldn't train with the team or couldn't get hit on the head. I couldn't do much with that, so I could have to do everything I had to do I was on my own. But then, you know, we figure out that if I have the helmet and protect it, then obviously working on my own, I limited the, the risk of getting hit. And after months when I started feeling good enough to start training and running and do more exercise, I started doing so. And with the helmet, obviously. And I play tennis and I went to the gym and I've done all these hand-eye coordination drills and you know, step by step, you know, I could feel how, how strong the body responded and how well everything went. Then uh, on Thursday, I remember that in January, on, was a, I think Thursday where the, or maybe Friday even, when the, when the surgeon said, okay, this has been 12 weeks, your skull looks good. If you play with the, if you train with the helmet, then, you know, you minimize the risk. There is always a risk, but you minimize the risk. So, so in a way you can start probably training with the team. So it was Friday, Saturday I trained with the team and Sunday I played the game. <laughs> Which I remember when I said to my wife, I said, ah, you know, Jose wants me to travel to Liverpool, to be with the team, to, uh, you know, to, for them to get a little bit of boost, that you are fine. And we arrived there and, and he, he said, okay, do you want to play? And I said, yes, I want to play. <laughs> So he, he put me in and I think he knew what he was doing because the, actually this, at the start of the season I had the shoulder surgery, I had repair, shoulder repair of both shoulders. So at the start of the season I was out and he actually tricked me when we, lo we, we, we lost the, one of the games at the start and then he asked me, he said to me, you know, I want you to travel to Blackburn. And I told him, I said, OK. And then he asked me the night before, he said, would you play? I trained once with the team and actually I couldn't save a shot. It was, a, it was even, I remember the look of some of the players looking at me like, what happened to you? You can't save the ball. And so we arrived at Blackburn and he asked me whether I want to play. And I told him, well, I, I don't think I can because, you know, having seen the session before, um, I just didn't believe that it would be the right thing to do. So we came to the pre-match meeting, he put the lineup and I was in. <laughs> and you know, you obviously sit in that meeting, everybody was looking at me. <laughs> I, and I, and, and I, knew, I didn't prepare anything. So normally you prepare your glove bag, you know, the helmet, boots, everything you need. So obviously he asked the kit man to prepare everything and to take everything. So I had all my stuff ready without me knowing it. And, and he knew that while I'm sitting in that meeting that I will not say that, that I'm not playing. So then I said, well, okay, is he, if it all goes wrong, it's, not, you know, it's his problem because he put me in. <laughs> so I went, uh, I went, we won one nil. I had a very good game. And I think sometimes these are the type of challenges you just have to take. You know, I, I know what I can do. I know what I can't do, so I try to not to do the things I can't do and, uh, and figure always out the ways I can do it. And, and so I played. So when that happened with the head injury, I, I knew I can. I was probably the fittest I've ever been because I had three months of, well, not my first month, but two months of complete uh, uh, training, which you know I've done hours and hours in the gym, on the tennis court, the hand-eye coordination, all these things. I was really fit. I knew that I'm fit. I'm, I knew I'm ready. So we go back to that preparation, when you know you're ready, you can. Although I didn't have, you know, I had one single session, I, I went, so I was confident that it was going to be okay. Um, so coming forward now to where your career is today, um, you've played and been a fan of ice hockey your whole life. Um, and more recently, you signed up to the British ice hockey team, Guildford Phoenix, who you led to victory this weekend. Um, how did that change of career happen? I'm sure a lot of people are curious to find out. Well, I think, you know, I, I had a few dreams when I was a, when I was a kid and, and I pretty much fulfilled all my dreams playing football. But one of the dreams when I was a kid, my first dream was actually be the ice hockey player and to play a, a game 
official game as an ice hockey player and uh, you know as an uh, any adult competition. Um, so thanks to football, I couldn't do that. So I I was using ice hockey during the years uh, as an extra work for me to keep fit and um, and to work on my hand-eye coordination and speed of reactions and even on the fitness because it's very demanding being a goal, goalkeeper in the, in the, on the ice and with all the equipment which weighs quite a, a lot. So I used that as a part of the preparation but obviously you know, having been a professional football player you never have a chance to, to play games because of the you know, insurance policy and as well I would love to see a football club where with the, with the salaries you get, if you go and say to your boss, you know, just maybe just don't play me today, I have an ice hockey game tomorrow, <laughs> and, and I might get injured and, and you pay me for nothing, so, you know, it wouldn't work. So I have to say that, that I had to wait 37 years for, uh, for my dream to, to come true. It came yesterday, actually, that, that happened, that I played the ice hockey game. We won 3-2 on penalties, and, um, and I, I really enjoyed that. It was a great experience, so I ticked the box of one of my dreams. So I ticked the boxes with the football dreams. And when I started drumming, you know, I, my, my wife finds it annoying. <laughs> because I, I don't know if you have any drummer here. Is anybody drummer here in the room? Oh, plenty. So, you know, when I had my first drum lesson, I only had few, but I remember the first one when I went. I wanted to know how, you know, how you hold the stick and how you can, do, which way you can practice. The, I remember the um, the the guy was a uh, he was a drummer himself, and he said to me, "You know, welcome to the world where people ask you if you are okay." And I told him, "What do you mean?" And he said, "You know, once you start drumming, you will be drumming everywhere you go." airports, you know, you knock the door, you knock the table, you, you hear the beat and everything starts going. And when you're sitting in the airport, people get the impression that you are afraid of flying. So that everybody keeps asking, are you okay? Are you nervous? Or, you know, is anything wrong? So I keep doing that and, and my wife doesn't, she doesn't like when you, you know, when you tap the tables and then, so obviously, you know, she, she was not that keen, but I, I kept laughing and I said, well, one, once, one day when you go to a concert and I play with the, ro in the, with the band and you sit and you be in the, uh, the audience, you will enjoy it. So it was a kind of like a, a long shot, but in, in 2013 I played a gig with 8,000 people in the, uh, in the, um, uh, for the, who turned up for the gig and I played with the band in the Rock for People Festival. And uh, it, was some, it was an amazing experience for me. So since then I played a few other gigs, which I try not to mention too much, because <laughs> people would think that I'm not doing my job properly. So, <laughs> um, But I ticked that box with the, with the dream as well. So I, I kind of, uh, I, I, like to ch you know, I like to challenge myself. And I always, every morning I, I, I wake up, I know that I'm lucky that I have another day to do something. So I, I, I hate to waste my time and, and people around me usually tell me how, you know, how can I survive living literally with all the things I'm doing together with the family and, and which is obviously the priority. So, you know, I try to, f you know, fill whole day minute by minute because, you know, you only live once and I think you should really go, you know, chase your dreams and try to, you know, do everything you can that you enjoy it. So. Um, on that note, we will turn to questions from the audience. So if you could put your hand straight up and a mic will come to you. Um, if we can go to the hand in the first row in the blue T-shirt, please. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to know, given the public information about your new role at Chelsea is a bit vague, I'd like to know what your responsibilities are and what's your working relationship with Frank, Joe Cole, and Marina. Also, a brief second question, when will JT and Didier come back? Thank you. Well, so my, um, if, you, if you look at the structure of the club, I'm, I'm, I'm a technical and performance advisor in, in whole football areas, which is 
you have the recruitment and scouting, you have first team, you have development squad, which is usually the, the players who are um, coming from the, from the academy and are on loan. And then you have the connection to the academy. So basically I'm kind of like an umbrella above that and I can, I can actually work with all that and um, try to be a sort of liaison and bridge from all, this, all that football part to Marina and the board. So they have the main, uh, obviously the main decision making, they are the boss, so I can always advise and, and ask to do certain things the way I see it, the way I want that to work and obviously uh, then I need to get the, uh, you know, they need to make it happen. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but, uh, but um, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting um, challenge for, uh, for me because I've seen it from the side of the player. Then as a senior player, I was always interested in the way the, the club works and then had the experience at Chelsea, had the experience in, in Arsenal. So. You know, to put all that experience together, I, I believe that you know I have something that you know I can actually work with, and and uh, probably that's why I was given the opportunity to do the job, and I work closely with uh, with Frank because I'm, I need to make sure that he he has everything he needs to concentrate on his um, on his uh, training and working with the with the first team, which is you know solely in responsible for and uh, we try to make sure that he has everything he needs to succeed and then the second part um, I think Didier became very busy man over the over the years since he retired so we will see how, what what uh, what his future holds and and obviously uh, John Terry is a uh, is working at the moment with Aston Villa so we will see you know I think at the moment you know, you don't you don't build an old friends re reunion, unfortunately. <laughs> so we try to build the club and the foundation the way that is right time for everything. So maybe one day there will be a it will be the right time for everybody to come but come back, and then you know you never know. But uh, there's a hard question to answer. If we could go to the yellow T-shirt right at the back. Ooh. Thank you. I'm probably in a minority of about one here that I'm a Newcastle fan. Um, but uh, so you were in the net for what is probably my favorite goal ever. And you probably are already realizing what I'm referring to. Um, so what, what were you thinking when Papisi say hit that ball? And what were you then thinking when it moved about 20 yards in the air and then flew over into the side netting? <laughs> Well, some, sometimes you would be amazed what the ball can do in the air. <laughs> and it was one of those moments where you, you know, you appreciate the, the power of physics. <laughs> but uh, at that moment, you know, obviously it was not the moment to, to enjoy because, you know, you, the, the, the way the ball was flying actually it changed the, the direction like three times and <laughs> and quite violently which you know i don't know how how he managed to do that and it was it looked like somebody had the remote you know with the and moved the ball as they needed so i had because the ball traveled quite far but 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 uh, quick I had two ideas and as the ball was changing direction i was changing my idea about what to do and in the end, I didn't manage to do any of these ideas. And, uh, <laughs> <I didn't>. so, <laughs> so sometimes, obviously, this, this is the unfortunate of being a goalkeeper. When you, when you have uh, ideas and you don't manage to execute them, then you, know, you run into trouble. And, and, and in the end, you know, I, sometimes you look back and you think, how did that happen, actually? And, and, and I have to accept that it was an exceptional moment where I tried to do what I needed to do and in the, it didn't work. So, you know, sometimes the, it, the ball beats you or the, the opponent beats you. And it wasn't, it wasn't a, uh, probably a, the spe most spectacular flight of the ball I experienced. No, I think every memory, you know, is, is a good memory. 
if we could go to uh, the hand in the front row. So I just wanted to ask about the psychological side of playing in goal in a team that's winning. So I remember my first Chelsea game that I was at. I think Chelsea were about 4 nil up at ha half time against Bolton and then the match ended up like 4-3 or something. And so is there ever an, ele an element of complacency that sets in, particularly trying to stay engaged when you're playing in goal and the ball's at the other end? You know, the, um, the probably the, the, the hardest lead to, to retain in football is to nil because to nil looks like you are in charge. Um, you think oh, it's fine if they score one, it's still two one. You still you are still in charge, but at the same time you concede two one, and you suddenly go, oh, it's only one goal now, and and suddenly the fact that you are two nil up and suddenly you kind of you were in a great position and you put yourself in the trouble and in the risk that you might not win the game, sort of changes everybody's feeling on the pitch, and. And it's, it can become quite hard to, you know, to get back into the game because the opponent at 2-0 <laughs> looks dead, if you say it this way. Suddenly they come back out of nowhere, they come to the game and they have the massive belief that, OK, now we cut the lead to, to only one goal and one goal is pretty much uh, uh, possible to score. So it's a complete shift of, of dynamic of, uh, you know, of both teams and it actually can put you under, under, under big stress. And, and under pressure, and, uh, and this is where you see so many times, you know, teams leading and losing the lead like that. But with 4-0, actually, we took it a little bit to an extreme because you go 4-1 and you think, okay, three goals, what can happen? Then you go 4-2 and it becomes actually kind of uncomfortable because you know that you were 4-0 and then everything was done and then you, you, know, you bring your opponent right in the game. And the moment they fall 4-3, no matter how much experience you have, you suddenly feel like, oh my God, we're going to blow that. <laughs> and, and actually, you start doing things you are not supposed to do. So you completely, sometimes you lose your, your way of executing the game, doing the right choices, and then suddenly, you know, the, the emotion takes over, the, the disappointment takes over, then the, angry, uh, the anger takes over because you are angry that you were 4 nil up and then you made a mess out of it. So, you know, that it can all play a part. And I think in that, in that Bolton game, suddenly it was like two corners and, and few rebounds and then we were 4 three. And then we had, a, we had to fight until the last second to, you know, to survive. But we managed to do so, but we made it much harder for ourselves. So sometimes, you know, when you are winning 1-0, it actually gives you that edge of that you know nothing is done and you have to really concentrate not to let the people to score and sometimes it helps so it depends on the approach but when you sort of relax for a for a few minutes and you think the game's done this is when actually it can it can bite you nicely in the backside uh, after so you know we, with the experience obviously it's better but uh, but it can always happen If we go to um, the hand over here in the blue jacket. Uh, thank you. Um, well, um, I have been a goalkeeper for three years and uh, I didn't bring my gloves today, uh, but I, I have some ex similar experience as you. Uh, I had a I got hit on my head on a wall and had a surgery to treat the problem, but although it's not on the 14th of October. <laughs> um, but oh, I, I remember the time that uh, for my first time that I uh, got on a pitch that I made so many mistakes that I got something like a zero five. 5 uh, I couldn't have a single save. So how would you um, uh, overcome this kind of challenge and adjust your expectation that other has uh, have on you if if i say it in a kind of a, like a um, easy way if they have some expectation is their problem i know i have my expectation and i have to sort of play my game 
So I try to concentrate really only on my game. So I know you as a goalkeeper, you go in at this level, everybody ex expects you to perform. So it's, it's, it happens every training, it happens every game. You have yourself, you know, when you go to the game, you want to win. So I, I know nobody who would like to go to the game and lose because this is not why you play sport on any, or you do not anything. So I don't, I don't think any of you goes to do a certain activity thinking, oh, I don't care if I win or not. I think, I, I don't, I, at least I don't. Anything I do, I try to do as best and, and, and win if possible. So then I expect myself to, to play my game. So my, my, my target is to play a perfect game. You can't play a perfect game. You, tr you, you can try to sort of go as close as possible to perfection. And this is always my target. But it, it doesn't have to be the game where you make 50 saves and, and the team win. No, it can be a simple things done well. So when, you know, that you are in the right time, in the right place, you give the right instruction to the right play at the right time. You have a, when you have a simple pass, you have a good control, you pass the ball exactly as you should. So things like that, actually, these are the, this, this is the process of what I was talking before. So basically just no matter what's the score, you just have to, you know, action by action, just process what you need to go. And if you do it as best as possible, then obviously it, the, the result will be as, as best as possible. So I try to ignore that uh, emotional side of, big game, small game, losing, winning. Should I, should I make the save? And maybe I should have saved the one before, but, but it's not gonna help me to, to finish the game on, the well, on, on a good note. So as I said, in my head, it's always nil-nil. No matter what's happening, I just go from each restart. It's, it's like second by second, it just keeps rolling like that. I can be disappointed after the game. You know, when the, you, know, you sit down and you think, why, why? and what, what happened and, and all these things. But during the process of playing the game, you know, you, I kind of keep the focus on the process, really executing the things. And, you know, sometimes uh, you, don't, you don't feel well. You go to the warm-up and, and it feels like, oh, it's going to be a disaster. You know, I feel, I feel tired. I don't feel really concentrated. My body does what it wants. And I had many, many warm-ups like that where then I finished the game end of the match. Because, you know, when I knew I'm in a bad day, when my body just, for whatever reason, is not responding in the warm-up the way I would like to, I just keep my game simple. Which meant, okay, if, if there is a ball I could chip over the player in the normal way when I felt, you know, when you feel everything's going fine, easy, confidence is high, then, you know, you control, chip the ball over the player, it's not a problem. When I knew I'm not, I'm not feeling like that, I would choose a simple solution. If it was just pass the ball to two meters to someone who will do it for me, I would just do that. So you just do simple things. Don't complicate, play the simple game. And then you have one good pass, second good pass, then you have one good take, one shot you take and you think, you know what? And, and suddenly game start going, 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 you execute it well, the confidence comes back and suddenly the game takes a completely different thing. So I would never go with, how it feels at the moment, because you know your emotional brain is a, is a nice liar, and sometimes doesn't really show you what it is really, and um, and then your you know your cortex, your thinking brain, if you, you know if you if you teach your brain to use that part rather than the emotional side, then you know you is basically just focusing on what you have to do. If I I don't know if I. Um, there is a, this, that, that table in, you know, in that you can see over there, it's quite large. Yeah? So if, if, I, if we put that table here and I ask you to walk across, yeah, so you will just walk on and just walk across. If we put it up there and I ask you to walk across, it's still the same table, it's still very large and it's very easy to walk across, but then your emotional brain will tell you, you're gonna fall, it's high, you know, what's, what's gonna happen? And this is where, you, if you start thinking about that you fall, you will, not, you will not be able to cross it. But if you just go, I just need to stay in the middle, step by step, keep the focus on walking in the middle, not falling side, not looking right, not looking left, just do what you have to do, you will cross it. So basically in a bad day, bad game, big game, 
this is a kind of thing you have to think about, not about the consequences, not about the score, not about how it looks or how much pressure it looks. You just go, okay, I need to cross there, I need to do this, and there is, there is a process how to get there. And then if you keep that, then obviously the pressure will be less and, and you get your, you know, and, and you, you just get your game back. Then you can sit back and say, okay, well, that was not good. And, and I go back to preparation. For me, the worst is to have regrets. If you do anything and you fail, for me, it's not an issue. If you, if you do everything you can, what is in your power to prepare. Because then we are all human, you, have, you can have a bad day. And, and if I prepare the game at 100% and then it went a complete disaster, I went home and I said, well, you know, I've done everything. I have nothing to blame. I have no regrets. This is football. This is life. You are not robot. And I accept that. If there was a little doubt in preparation, thinking, you know, I had two days prior to game, I, I didn't train as I should, and I was a bit lazy or slow, or I didn't watch all the videos for the, you know, for the strikers, then I would sit home and thinking, okay, you got what you deserve, you didn't prepare, and then in the end, you know, it, 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 it happened. So that, that would bother me for a whole week or until the next game. I would have that in the mind and it would kind of eat my brain. So and anything I, I do, I try to avoid this kind of feeling. So if I fail, I fail. I have no problem with that if I know I prepared. But, you know, I, I don't like to think that I haven't done anything uh, enough or everything I could to prepare better. All right. Um, if we could go to uh, the hand in the middle at the back. It's the one behind, sorry. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Hello. Uh, do you play FIFA or PES? <laughs> I, I, I missed that. You do you play FIFA or PES? Ah, I actually, you know, one of, one of, um, there, is a, there is a nice phenomenon in, in, in football and ice hockey, I have to say. All my friends who play ice hockey play FIFA or, or the Pro Evolution Soccer. All, like, I, I never play FIFA because I, I don't... I get very frustrated by the way the, the game behaves. <laughs> <laughs> and it's obviously never my fault. And, and I hate the fact that I don't, I don't have the control over it. Yeah? Because obviously it's, it's a bit random. So although you, you, you have your remote, I would like to think that the, comp, the, com, the, the goalkeeper particularly does not do what he should. <laughs> and I know what he should do. <laughs> and I can't make him do that, so it actually frustrates me. So, so if I play uh, any, 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 anything with, uh, um, I, would play, I would play the NHL ice hockey game. So that's, that's, that's the game I play. But I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't really, I don't really play, you know, it's very occasionally. But sometimes I play with my son, which uh, is a tough uh, competition. And the fact that you're losing to your 10-year-old son is actually <laughs> even more frustrating than you think. So maybe, maybe one day you will know how it feels, you know, that I, I should be the one who wins. And suddenly, you know, he, he actually played better than me. So I try to avoid that as well, not to get disappointed. Any other questions? Um, if we go to uh, the hand in the front row over here. Sorry, the one next to Yeah. Dobrý večer. Um, ah. I've noticed you play golf as well, so I wanted to ask you, what's your handicap, first of all? Um, what's your favorite club? And what's your favorite golf course? Oh. So I do play golf very badly, but I do play. Um, I play golf probably three times a year because I don't, I don't have time for it. So during holidays, usually I go, or, or during the year, sometimes I go with some friends, just I join, join in. I, the, the, the issue I have with, with golf is that it's one of those sports where you have to practice regularly to be good at. And I, I don't, obviously don't do it. So when I go to play three times a year, you go 
30 balls on the driving range and then you go straight in and uh, then the result look like it. So I, I play around 20, although I play three times a year, so I'm kind of proud of that, I have to say. And, um, you know, some, some days is, is, is worse, some days is better, but, uh, but you know, around 20 is, is my right handicap. And uh, I would like to play more often, but with all my hobbies and family and work, I, you know, it's hard to find all the, all the time I, I would need for that. But the favorite club, I would say my favorite club is the, uh, it depends purely on the day. So sometimes, sometimes things are happening, I don't even know why, but uh, usually the, the five iron, I would say five iron is my favorite club because it's probably the one I'm most consistent. I don't know why, but uh, it's the, usually the one I'm, I use, if I can, I use the, I use, uh, the most. And the last, what was the uh, favorite golf course? Um, I, I, I like to play in, in Spain because you have nice weather, nice golf course, and, and I think this is where I, you, I, you enjoy it the most. You know, if you have a rainy day with the, with the wet ball and everything, and for, for, the, for the golfer of my skills, it's kind of too, too challenging, so, and it's cold as well. I don't, you know, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't go golfing in the type of day like this. If we go to um, the hand in the second row on the right. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to know, you talked a bit about body language uh, in real life, so in, in football, how does body language, when you, for example, give advice to uh, newcomers in the academy or, or something else, uh, how does uh, how does body language uh, can be uh, uh, can be taught, and how in a few seconds, for example, on one down players that you don't know on the opposite team, can you guess on which size uh, which side the the ball is going to go, or um, like if, can you make a guess in a few seconds what happens at, in your mind at that moment? Is it it's instinct or is it practice training? Well, in training, you, you face, I start with this one. In, in practice, um, you, you train and obviously you see people shooting. And I, I think I will show you because I think it's easier to explain. <laughs> so I'm, um, I'm left, I'm predominantly, you know, left footed. So if, if you have a left footed player who, who shoot, so if I want to shoot to my left side, Obviously, I have to shoot, and I will open my. I ha you have to open your, your, you know, your your glute, and then you have to open your foot. But in order to shoot there, you have to have a right balance. The players shoot with like a big power and big strength. So obviously, to to place the ball there, they have to have a good stability. So basically, your hands come probably behind, and you you sort of hold, like that, that you don't fall. If if, if you shoot hard, I go down because I don't want to fall. <laughs> if, you, if you shoot hard, obviously you will, you will try to make the, the, the swing the hardest and then you know, put the power through. So you, you will, in order not to fall, you have to lean forward, put your hands in the balance, and then you shoot. So basically you can see that doing this or doing that it makes a big difference. Obviously, in a, it's, a, it's a split of the second, and it's hard to, you know, so you need to read it well, but these are kind of things you learn every training. When you see people shooting against you, you suddenly realize. So when you train, when you train with, the, with the players for five, six years, you pretty much know every time where they shoot. So they have to actually try to disguise the shot and, and, and figure out how to beat you different way. So this is one, this is one thing. The body language actually, you, when you start it, it, it um, I think in a professional sport, if, if you look at certain players, um, they, they don't show much sign of fatigue, pressure, or, or that it's something is not right. And, and actually it's very hard to see 
if you play if you play against someone and you see every time he makes a bad pass goes like this <sighs> then you know that the player is actually not feeling well and is probably completely low of confidence so then you know that if you get the ball this is actually the player to target because you know he's not you know he's not in the right frame of mind and then you see three of them in the team and then you go okay the, you know job's done we are already winning 2-0 <laughs> because they are afraid so basically there is a lot there is a big part of the the, the winning or losing is actually the this 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 kind of psychological setup on the game when you go in and and the team then the team starts and you see they are all determined ready to go f f you know going to every challenge and and suddenly going fast playing with energy then you go like Oof, okay it's going to be a tough game so you know you have to match them in terms of that so the body language is actually very important as well that you don't show you frustrated nervous that something is not right because the, the opponent can use it and especially if you play individual sport if you play tennis i think you know you would never see federer putting his head down he might not be happy but the way he looks is always the same with nadal is the same thing you know so it kind of puts that consistent body language that the, that the opponent never knows whether they they are feeling good bad how and then you know it's very hard to you know to 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 read into it so it, it makes a big difference in the end in, in in small details decide big games and th this might be one of the small details so if you see people like coming with a really good energy positive approach you know spirit aggressivity the right things then obviously it puts you you know it, it can put you in the in the back foot so it's important and and as well towards the referee for example you know the body language to react different situation on the pitch it, it plays the part it can it can actually show as well whether you're nervous you know distracted or angry or and and then you know it when you know you play you play against the team where eight eight players are constantly arguing with the referee you know that they are not co concentrated on the on the on the game they actually concentrate on something completely else and then you know it's going to be easier to uh, to beat them i think that is all we have time for today um thank you so much for joining us here today peter and thank you everyone please join me in thanking <laughs>